tied in stuff, I kind of tied in a little bit to what I'm talking about today. There is a, a place that our country, and we've talked about numerous times, and I know here we are celebrating the birthday of our country, our freedom as a country, as a nation, and we look around, and you don't want to talk about all the negative things, but the reality is, as believers, we can look around or turn on the news and understand that there are a lot of negative things, and that's just the, the reality of it. But again, our freedom is found in Christ. Our freedom comes no matter what's going on in this country, no matter what the plans are for this country, our freedom is still in Christ, and that's something we should celebrate daily as well. But looking at the anxiety-filled believers across this country, I believe it affects, it, well, I know it affects everything. When you, if you've never studied or sat under Mr. Adama teaching divine institutions, or sat under me teaching divine institutions, the nation is the one that's affected right now. We see it because that's what we see all over the media. But in order to have a strong nation, we have to have strong families. In order to have strong families, we have to have strong marriages. In order to have strong marriages, we have to have strong individuals. And that's the way it feeds off of each other. So a lot of people say, well, how come, how, what do you think is wrong with this country? What do you think we could do to change this country? And I say, well, uh, the divine institution or the institution of nation is only going to be as strong as the institution of families. And you start looking at families and then it goes down the line. So we have an issue of a lot of anxiety, a lot of not understanding. And this leads into what I want to talk about today is a question that I get asked constantly and have been asked for 31 years of, of doing ministry of some sort. It's what is my life for? Or what is, another way to word it, is what is my purpose in this life? And to understand this, first you have to understand as a Christian, it's, it needs to be broken down into two lives, basically. Um, for instance, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. So to understand, when people ask me, they say, well, what, what is my purpose? I, I'm struggling, and this will call anxiety. If you don't know the purpose or what your life's for, it will cause you to be anxious. Because you question and constantly, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I don't understand where God is putting me. Why am I here? Why do I have this job? Why do I live where I live? Not understanding your purpose in life will cause you to be anxious about a lot of things. So again, first breaking that question down and understanding that there's two lives. There's pre-salvation and there's post-salvation. Pre-salvation is pretty easy. What is the purpose of the life in pre-salvation? It is to ultimately get to the point where you accept the free gift that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, right? That's the purpose. There is no other purpose for eternity that means anything pre-salvation other than acceptance of the gospel. So that's the first thing. So if, if someone's not a believer, you don't waste their time on all this other stuff about their purpose of life post-salvation, post-faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So get them to the point of acceptance of the free gift that Christ gives. So understanding when someone asks you, what's my purpose, what's the meaning, what's my life for, you have to first assess whether or not they're a believer or not. If they are a believer, then, then the whole purpose of life changes. Before salvation, again, the only purpose in life is the acceptance of that free gift. Because here's the thing, there is no hope or purpose. Once the free gift is accepted, then the hope and purpose of your life completely changes. It's, 
It's a new life. Like I said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you are a new creature. You are born again, right? In other verses, John 3, 3 and 1 Peter 1, 23, and it talks about the newness and all these things. So understand that I'm talking to you as believers. What is the purpose? What is your meaning in this life? Because I believe that all believers... If we understood more ultimately what the purpose is in our life, we could change this great nation. If we all understood and pursued the purpose that God has for our life, we could watch this nation change back to Him. Purpose and meaning begin the instant you put your faith in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what is that purpose? Well, to understand it, you have to understand a few things. The first thing is you were built for purpose. Think about that. You were built for purpose. In Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared for beforehand so that we could walk in them. So what does this tell? God, they, God considered you personally, this is what this is telling us, that God considered you personally enough to give you your own unique personality and abilities and match them with your own unique purpose. Right? Right? Again, listen to the verse, Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works or for service, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. So again, He personally, He considered you personally enough to give you your own unique personality and abilities and match them to your own very unique purpose. In other words, you were made to order. You were made to order by God. That's one way to say it that hopefully you'll understand. God knew who you would be and what He had in store for you long before you were born. Long before you were born, God knew who you would be and He knew what He had in store for you. Who who you are as a person, your strengths, your weaknesses, your likes, your dislikes, um, all of these things are matched to what it is that He had for you to accomplish. See how that works? Again, His workmanship is what created you. Right? He created you. His workmanship created you for what? Good works. For service. So therefore, all the strengths and weaknesses, the likes and dislikes, the everything about you, He knew beforehand. So He picked your uh, accomplishments to match who you are. Destiny. Destiny. Yeah, great word for it. That's it. It's this is your strengths, your weaknesses, your likes, your dislikes, your personality, your God-given abilities, your God-given talents. Here they are. Now here is the accomplishments that I have laid out for you through your service. It's beautiful. Two, your personal history has equipped you for your purpose. Your personal history has equipped you for your purpose. What do I mean that by that? I mean no regrets. Don't dwell on what's in the past because it's the past. A lot of people fail to, to buy in or seek the purpose that God has laid out for them and an accomplish thing that God has laid out and match them up to because they say, well, the things in my past are preventing me from doing that. Don't let the past define who you are. Romans 8.28, you all hopefully know it. If you don't, you should. And we know that God causes all things, all things, not some things, 
Not the things that he likes or the things that he don't like. Not the things that you like or you don't like or your parents like or they don't or your kids like or your pastor likes, right? He says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for what? Good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. A lot of people leave out the second part of that verse. They see bad things based on what? Bad decisions. <laughs> and then they turn around and go, well, you know God will work it out for the good. Well, for those who love God, and then He's called according to His purpose. In other words, those that are living, trying to serve Him and seeking the purpose that He has for them. Then he'll take it, work for the good. So all the things in the past, and again, saying it, has equipped you for that purpose. Let it make you stronger. Let God take it through your pursuit of Him and the purpose in your life. Let Him use that to turn it to good in your life. Again, no regrets. Don't dwell on it. Push forward. Third thing, it's really His purpose working in you. See, we think about, and I've said it, that the, your purpose for... But it's really His purpose that's working in you. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Many We have so many ideas... Well, some of us, some of you... Some more than others have so many wonderful ideas in your heart. So many not so wonderful ideas in your heart. And that's a good thing. Is to constantly be looking at how to, to improve and to grow spiritually and to, to accomplish things for Christ. But understand that no matter what the ideas are in your heart, the counsel of Lord will always stand. It's His purpose. The Bible indicates that plan tends to look at things from man's side of the equation and purpose tends to look at all things from God's side. See the difference? Plan is from man's side of the equation. Purpose is God's side. The biggest problem with our concept of purpose lies in just whose purpose we're really talking about. We're all too eager for God's purpose to fit into our plans. We do it all the time. We make plans and we think that it's what God wants us to do, so therefore we try to squeeze the purpose that God has laid out for us into our plans. We're really big on believing that God's purpose is to prosper us or to give us good health or to keep us from safe and harm, but we're not so big on God's purpose being personal sacrifice and personal holiness or personal obedience. See, we think about this idea that, that oh, well, God's purpose, you know, something must be going on because God's purpose for my life is to be wealthy and healthy. And uh, look at one of the biggest movements across going against grace in this world is this, they call the prosperity gospel. It's everywhere. Because see, the idea is, well, God's plan for my life is for me to be, His purpose in my life is me to be healthy and wealthy. And if I'm not wealthy, then I must not be pursuing His purpose for my life. It's a bad place to be. We don't want to think about that sometimes God pur His purpose for our lives at that moment is sacrifice. Isn't it? We had Wednesday night, we had Pastor Joe speaking. It was wonderful. He spoke a while, but it was wonderful. I mean, 
I was getting text messages like, uh, what's going on? He's all the way from Uganda. Give him a minute. You know, good grief. But you understand, he, he was thrown in prison over there for preaching, and as, a, as a young man, for preaching, just handing out pamp tracts and preaching Jesus through the joy that it put in his soul, not because somebody gave them to him and said, go hand these out, or not because somebody said, here, I'll pay you to do this. No, it was strictly because the overcome, overwhelming joy that was in his soul, he said, I'm, i got to share this. In Uganda, when Elami was the dictator, one of the most evil dictators in the world, there's movies about it, right? And he, he's going around, he's preaching Jesus. And they threw him in prison. And this prison was a special prison where they were going to kill them. They would go to this prison, wouldn't come out. Well, what'd he do? He preached Jesus. A sacrifice. That was God's purpose for his life at that moment, wasn't it? So see, it's not all about, well, I'm not healthy and wealthy, so I must be doing something wrong. No, it's we forget about God's purpose being about sacrifice and personal holiness, personal uh, uh, evaluation. Taking the Word of God and using it as a mirror and sometimes going, wow, I see something ugly. I mean, I do that quite very... But you know what I mean. Spiritually, you look at it and you say, this is not pretty. This is not Christ-like. I have to evaluate. I have to... Uh, Romans 12, 2, I have to stop conforming myself so that He can transform me to something pretty, something beautiful, which is Christ-like. So it takes this idea of sacrifice and really asking yourself the hard questions and making changes and showing up at church and showing up at Bible study and taking personal time for study and prayer. And like Mr. Adam said first, have praying with true joy. I mean, you are entering the throne room of God and obeying. Huh. Teens, you hate to hear that, don't you? I need you to go do this. I want to do it, Dad. Well, guess what? God says it, and we do the same thing. We, we, bless you, we get mad when our children don't obey us, but when God says, hey, go do this, we go, well, that's kind of hard. We want to go to the easy places. We want to go to the healthy, wealthy purpose area. That's the parking lot I want to sit in. The healthy, wealthy. But God says, whoa, I need you to sacrifice. Will you do it? I don't want to. Hmm. Obedience. How often do we pray, Thy will be done and really mean it? How often do you pray, God, whatever it is, no matter what I think my plans are, no matter what I think's best for my life, your will be done in my life and I will accept that and find joy in that. I don't think we do enough. I, speaking for myself, you, know, you may be perfect at it. But I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we look and say, God, your will be done in my life. No matter what it is. Whether it's sacrifice, whether it's it's struggling in this world. I'll find joy in the fact that it's your purpose for my life. Your will be done. Most important thing to remember is that your purpose is really His purpose for your existence. God's purpose for man is to glorify Himself. His purpose for your existence is that you may glorify Him. So what if God's will, His purpose for your life doesn't include health and wealth and happiness? Would you still be able to pray, Thy will be done? Sometimes His purpose will override our plans. 
And that's as it should be. There are some things a lot more important than health, wealth, and happiness. There are some things that are more important than life itself. Again, the purpose of our life is to glorify Him. Now you can break that down into many subcategories that glorify Him. You can break it up into the spiritual gift that He gives every believer and your role in the local body and the church. You can break it down to your obedience to Him. You can break it down to how you take on the role as a husband and a father or a, a whatever you want to do. But all of these things ultimately are to glorify Him. You understand that? When we as Christians are told the Great Commission, right? To go out and make disciples. We do that through a life that's seeking the purpose He has for us to glorify Him. That's how we make disciples. We let them look at us, and like Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, we should do the same. We should live seeking His purpose for our life, therefore glorifying Him through our daily walk, and then others look at and copy that. So, when people ask what your purpose is, or if they ask what their purpose is, tell them to seek God's purpose. Because that's what it's about. We can do things like that. We can latch on and change the fact that we're trying to squeeze His purpose into our plans. And we can make bigger strides in our home lives, in our churches, and ultimately in this nation. But it starts with us as believers. It starts with us looking in the mirror and saying, God, the purpose that you've laid out for me is to glorify you today. I'll do it at work. I'll do it at school. I'll do it at the store. I'll do it at church. I'll do it wherever you send me. I will strive to glorify you. No matter if it's health or wealth, or sacrifice and trials, I will still glorify you in that. So let's pray and then we'll take the offering and then we'll close with the pledge. Father, thank you for all of these people that are here today. What a wonderful day, celebration of your son. Lord, it's an honor to be a part of this church and be home with this family. We do lift up John Dyer today. Uh, we pray that you'll just heal him. Lord, give the doctors that are dealing with him the wisdom and, and to know that they're just a tool, that you're the ultimate physician, you're the ultimate surgeon. So we do lift up him, give him comfort and peace during this difficult time. We also lift up Rhonda. Rhonda's not feeling well, so just pray again that you'll heal her. Give her peace and comfort, and of course all the prayer requests that we have, Lord, the ones that are in the bulletin, the ones that aren't. Pray that you'll heal those that need healing, protect those that need protecting. But Father, thank you for this weekend. Thank you for this nation as we celebrate the birthday. Wow, what a wonderful nation. Despite where we are now, Lord, we are still the greatest nation on the face of this earth. And what an honor to live here. What an honor you've placed us here and you still have young men and women that are volunteering to go out and protect the fact and the right that we're able to do what we're doing today. So we love you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was trying. I was trying. <laughs> Rick brought here. Would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.